It's amazing to think it's 30 years since the finish of the 1981 Grand National, a race that was flashed around the world because it was an incredible story. They even turned it into a film as well. The horse had come back from, well, almost the dead to win. The jockey had almost come back from the dead as well because he'd had cancer and he'd fought his way back. And that man since then has helped raise 14 million pounds for his cancer trust. It's an incredible story. He now lives here in this village just outside Newmarket. It is, of course, Bob Champion, MBE. Paintings like this adorn the walls of the beautiful house. Do you still remember that feeling, jumping that particular fence? Yeah, I can remember the majority of the race. You know, it's a race you'll always remember. Like a lot of winners, um, it's the fall, races you fall in. You don't try to remember too much. <laughs> Is it true that when Josh Gifford gave you the leg up before the race, he said to you, now sit, 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 don't hit the front until going to the last fence? True, yes. yes it was, but um, it was the way we always used to ride the horse, but um, you know, Josh knew, I knew the horse very well and um, you know, I did hit the front earlier than I wanted to, but... Well, um, a circuit early. Well, about three and a half miles earlier actually. <laughs> um, but I was never worried because I was controlling the pace of the race then, let's be honest, and I kept getting breathers into him. And when I'd finished second in the Scottish National, I only took it up going to the last and got beat, so and I always thought that day I should have gone on earlier. Maybe I've got beaten further, but um, looking back on it, I may have won, may have not. He was some horse though, wasn't he? Yeah, he was a good horse, let's be honest. Um, he didn't run many times in his life. You know, he started his, his career winning a two-mile novice hurdle at Ascot, um, then finished fourth in the um, Sun Alliance those days at Cheltenham. Mm. And then, you know, basically he started getting leg problems every year. And how close was he to being put down? Did the vets actually say, this horse's legs are so bad, we're going to have to put him down? Yes, when he broke down at Sandown, definitely. The vets did advise the owners, Nick and Brikos, the, um, to put him down because they gave him no chance of recovery. But um, I said one day when he won at Leicester, the Silver Fox, he'd win a Grand National one day. Um, and they must have believed me. And, um, you know, they gave the horse a chance, but I think he helped himself an awful lot too because he was such a good patient. Let's be honest, he was in a stable for six months in plaster, not being able to walk around or lay down. Um, you know, that must have been hard for him and just a great patient. It's amazing you're both sort of good patients because that horse's sort of injury almost ran alongside yours. Can you remember when you, you found out that you had cancer? Um, yeah, I can remember. Um, I was at the Royal Marsden, you know, saw Professor Peckham and he told me I had it in two parts of my body. And I remember I saw you that night mm -hmm. and I felt like jumping out of the top story of the, the hotel of the hotel yeah, yeah we stayed in the same room and i remember you, you came back it's a true story he said and you, and i was trying to get to sleep and you were pacing up and down weren't yeah. you and what did you say i'm going to kill myself i said well go on kick on because i want to get to sleep <laughs> <laughs> typical you <laughs> hey but tell us how did you know you you're in america you you're a top jockey you'd gone for your holiday in america and you, you'd sort of not fall in love but you'd gone out with a beautiful girl who just happened to be a vet and yes. it was, and that, that saved your life? Of course it did, yeah. Tell us I must admit, just because um, she seemed to know what was wrong and her advice was go back to England and see a specialist. Thankfully, I got a plane out that following evening, landed at Heathrow, rang Alan Thomas at the Park Street Clinic, who used to patch all us jockeys up those days, and he said, I'll have an appointment at the Royal Marsden for you that morning and um, he knew what was wrong. I didn't have a clue what was wrong. I was given 35, 40% chance of living. If I'd got it 18 months before, there was no chance, there was no cure whatsoever. And um, they were pumping platinum, bleomycin and been blasted into me. 
and that's quite a toxic mixture, I promise you. Mm -hmm. And I was sick 24 hours a day. It was horrendous and um, ended up coming out of hospital eight stone seven. Well, I'd never been eight stone seven from the day I'd been born, so I was even thinking about trying to be a flat jockey again. <laughs> but that was incredible. You, people gave you no chance of, I mean, the, your survival was incredible, but riding again and then perhaps thinking of, of winning. Was it true you thought with, with Alderniti getting better and you getting better, was that at the back of your mind that the Grand National could be on? Yeah, always was. I was very fortunate. I had him to come back to another horse, good horse called Kaibo, who was a machine as well. And they kept giving me heart, I must admit. And, um, you know, the reason I went back to America um, to get fit, really because of the weather. It was very cold in England that time of year. I couldn't breathe well because of my lungs. You were going, <gasps> and that was just you sitting down, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, and I thought, well, I'll go to the States. I knew Burley Cox's horses would be in South Carolina Which that time of year. Yeah. Weather would be nice and warm. And it did help me, let's be honest. I think it got me back three months quicker than if I'd stayed in England. Yeah. I'd have got fit in England, but not as quick. So you were getting better, you were getting stronger, but what about Alderniti at this time? I mean, you know, he was still a long way back from even racing again. Oh, good God, you know, when I came back, he was still in his boxing plaster, let's be honest. And, um, and I suppose October, November time, um, they started riding him out back at the Embricoses, and they must have done a couple of months road work. And he came back to Josh's January the 1st, 1981. So um, Josh had, what, two or three months to get him fit again. And describe the day for us, you know. I mean, 1981, old and 80, he'd come back from the dead, you'd come back from the dead, the world was watching. Well, one, it was a lovely sunny day. I'll always remember that. Um, I remember sitting on him in the morning, about half seven, and the first time in his life he was so relaxed in the morning because he used to pull pretty hard. He was so relaxed, I'd never known the horse so well ever in my whole career riding him. And um, he gave me so much confidence on the morning and in the afternoon I couldn't see myself getting beat. Really? With luck. Yeah. And the race just went so nice. Yeah, the race panned out really well, let's be honest. Um, Overjumped the first fence, <laughs> not so great at the second. Uh, third fence, which is a big ditch, um, he realised how big it was and um, jumped it nicely. From that moment, he was a dream to ride. Um, I remember jumping beaches about 29th. And I must have had a better run around the canal turn than anybody else because... Um, I ended up jumping to the front at Valentine's, which is three fences later. On the first circuit? On the first circuit. <laughs> and, but to be honest, I was never really worried um, because I looked beside me and um, one side, Rubstick, um, was there. He'd won a couple of years before. The other side of me, Sebastian, had finished fourth the year before. Then I thought back a few Red Rums Nationals and... Um, I remember when Bob Davis won on Lucius, he took it up a lot earlier than he wanted to, but he still won. You know, horses either adapt to Liverpool or they don't. And um, if they're loving it, they get in ground every fence without taking anything out of themselves. And as um, long as you get into a nice rhythm, they'll keep galloping. And passing the post, what was it like the immediate minutes after winning the National? Um, very strange, actually. Um, it meant so much to me, um, you know, it's very hard, I promise you, you know, I was absolutely so delighted. Um, John Thorne was the um, first person to congratulate me. I hadn't realised he'd finished second mm -hmm. till later in um, the afternoon. Um, but the first thing I thought about was, don't forget to weigh in. <laughs> and I knew the governor would say that as soon as I got off the horse, but um, that was the first thing in my mind and then had to do all the TV press interviews. Um, nearly forgot I'd arrived in a race an hour later. <laughs> and, um, you know, I remember getting down to the start thinking, well, I've won a national and now I'm down here in a novice hurdle. <laughs> Back to reality. Back to reality.
But then you started the Bob Champion Cancer Trust. You've raised, what, 14 million pounds? Yeah. People think it was me that set it up, but it wasn't. It was people out in the country, everybody who'd backed me, had sent their winnings to the Royal Mars in care of me. And Professor Peckham and Nick and Brikos, the horse's owner, thought it'd be a good idea to set it up. I don't think we ever thought it would be still running now. Let's be honest, we thought it might run two or three years and done its course, but we're still going there. We've got our own research laboratories that we built and um, we run. And um, thankfully, it's coming up with the goods. And you've raised so much money for such a worthy cause. And what is it now, a 95% success rate? On testicular cancer, it's 95%. But now we've moved on to prostate cancer. And let's be honest, one in 10 men will get prostate cancer. And, um, you know, we've got to come up with cures and find out which prostate need certain treatments and some prostates need no treatment. And um, it's defining which one needs which. And 30 years ago, you go back this year, 2011, you've got you, you, a lovely charity race, all your old pals coming back to ride in a fundraising race. Yes, it is, actually. The legends, um, isn't it? The legends, yeah. entry legends. Um, hope people will get um, involved in it and sponsor a few jockeys. Just look up on the website, uh, bobchampion.org.uk. But, you know, the likes of Peter Skews coming back to the saddle, um, Charlie Swan, 10 times... Um, Irish champion, then you've got your Carl Llewellyns, um, Jim Colottis, Marcus Armitage, um, Charlie Fenix coming over from America. He? Um, he's really looking forward Great. to it. Um, Jimmy Frost um, and lots more. I'm just running out of names, but um, there's 12 of them. And going back this year, 30 years on, what sort of memories? When you walk through those, you drive up to Liverpool, you know, and do the memories come flooding back? Yeah, of course it do, you know, and um, every time I go up to Liverpool, I love it. Let's be honest, before I ever won a national, um, it was my greatest ambition to ride in a national from about the age of eight. And um, I can remember the first time I ever got round, and to me that was one of the biggest thrills of my life. Um, it was the Chris Red Rum National, and I rode Hurricane Rock 250 to one, and he jumped the last in third place and finished fourth or fifth. Um, and that, to me, was a tremendous feeling, I promise you. From that day on, I wanted to win one. Well, actually, it's true what you were saying there, because do you remember when we were two little kids and we went to, to red car races? It's a true story, this. And uh, John Rickman, do you remember John Rickman? He used to present the ITV. And he grabbed us and said, here's two little boys. And I was six and you were seven or whatever. And he said, what do you want to be some when you grow up? And I said, I want to be a TV rating presenter like you. You said you wanted to be Peter O'Sullivan. Shut up, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but he is brilliant. <laughs> the I, best. The best. And you said, he said, what do you want to be? And you looked at him and said, I want to ride the winner of the Grand National. And he did. It's an incredible story. And you know your stepdaughter, Ali, isn't she got a lovely voice? And she sung the song. Yes, um, she sung Sometimes, Sometimes, which was the theme music to the film. And she's got a beautiful voice, the voice of an angel. We try to understand why the world stops turning and takes away the things we planned.